Thank you. Welcome to the January 23rd, 2024 Board of Trustees meeting. Can I ask for a roll call? Mr. Kaling. Present. Dr. Spencer Robinson here. Mr. Quadro. Present. Mayor Ciara is doing something. Dr. Obama. Here. Request to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Mm -hmm. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. business is the nomination and election of chair. May I ask for a nomination for chair? I nominate Mr. K. Lane. Is there a second? section pertaining to the founding of Smith <coughs> School. I direct the trustees to pay over to the town of Northam such an amount that may be necessary in the first place on purchasing a farm or tract of land for a pattern farm to be approved in practical details as to become a model as far as can be affected by time and expense to farmers generally. To the second place, another farm be designated as an ex experimental farm, experimental farm, to aid and assist in the labors and improvements of the pattern farm in the art and science of husbandry and agriculture. I direct that suitable buildings shall be erected on said farms for the use and accommodation thereof of other buildings convenient for the residents of mechanics and workshops and tools shall be provided suitable for the manufacture of implements of husbandry of the moot improvement models of the invention of the artists employed for the business of the farms 
the school thereafter mentioned and also for sale in the benefit of the institution. It should be thought best to extend the manufacturing establishment to other trades and for other purposes in the manufacturing line. There should also be established on the premise of the School of Industry and pupils shall be of fair character and shall be instructed in the art and science of agriculture and some mechanic art in the shops attached to the premises. And I further direct that a suitable number of competent instructors and artists shall always be provided and employed in the various branches and departments of the establishment. The establishment shall be called Smith's Agricultural School and it shall be chosen by ballot by the inhabitants of said town, three discrete freeholders living in Northampton or elsewhere, one of whom shall be a, a husbandman, one mechanic, who shall have the control and superintendence of the whole establishment shall annually report in writing to said town the state of the funds and expenditures, the improvements made on the premises, and the state of the school and institution in general. At this time, I'm going to ask for the mission statement. Mission statement, Smith Vocational Agricultural High School is to prepare students for social responsibility, employment, and post-secondary education through rigorous applied technical and academic programs. Is there any participation by the trustees? Um, not at this time, but uh, I invited Mr. Uh, Parrott speak on behalf of the building committee. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so tonight we have a couple of speakers and I'd like to ask which gentleman from the building committee please be first. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is John Parrott. Um, I was a teacher here in antiquity and mm -hmm. my wife is a teacher uh, at Northampton's uh, JFK. My expertise is I have a PhD in forestry and land management and um, an expertise in uh, renewable energy choice. And so one of the challenges of this new building is a challenge I think that many of us are also facing in our own lives. We're being recommended to choose more responsibly how we move ourselves, whether it be through EVs or whether we should take the trip after all, or how we heat our homes. Should we use air source heat pumps or some other renewable heating approach? The reality is those more responsible choices tend to be more expensive choices, and we need to have the aid of public funds to sort of facilitate that. And so the green economies are equivalent to our traditional conventional economies. This challenge is coming into full view with the new school building. There is two options on the table. One is a steel building, and the reality is steel is a very energy intensive uh, material that takes a great deal of mining and energy to forge, and the other is a wood uh, stick uh, built building. Wood is carbon, so one has a carbon debt and one has a carbon benefit, but the reality is the wood building costs more. And so that's a dilemma. The fundamental goal is to provide the appropriate learning space for the young people who are challenged by the loss of building due to fire. And so what is our choice? It is not dissimilar to the residential choices that lots of us are facing. So I, I, I ask the committee to have some sort of patience and recognition that green energy, green choice is more complicated, often more expensive, but is virtuous because that is what we should be teaching our young people just for sort of the cultural sustainability if not just the next path because that is apparently the right direction for us to go for climatic reasons. So this is going to cost more, but I just got an email that I believe the state is going to step up, and I'm guardedly optimistic in a big way. So it's either not going to step up, and you have a steel building, and we're going to make the best of it, because the teaching in alignment with the will and the mission statement is the goal of this school. But there's other ways to approach it, and if the state can find that miracle money, 
and I hope that we can embrace that and celebrate the virtue an even better building might represent so that it can help the young people better understand choice and the challenges of that choice. So the reality is it will cost more. I'm hoping that we can land a, a state grant to bridge the difference, which is about a million dollars to be truthful trying to get as close to apples to apples between the two buildings. But the reality is it's not an insignificant amount of money. Can you elaborate that on that, John, a little bit more of the potential grant money? Um, I'm not sure I can because I'm not at liberty. I'm, I'm not the mm -hmm. decider. I do not work for the state. But I did. And so I have a connection to many of the decision makers. And we had a uh, uh, a member of the state uh, DCR here earlier who is the wood utilization forester for the Commonwealth and so he also spoke with the official and they will be calling you tomorrow to have a conversation which I think is very promising but promises are great what you need is a check you need certainty and uh, confidence and the reality is that is welcome but you have to make a choice and the choice is to provide the students with the learning uh, environment that they need. And so I'm asking that the board entertain the idea of delaying final choice on building material decision until your February meeting. I, I can't make any promises, but I'm optimistic. There's about 50 million in funds that are going to be announced by the governor for climate smart forestry. And there's a real possibility that they will give out 49 million to municipalities for climate smart forestry and give one to you. That's, there's a real possibility of that. That's the simple suggestion I offer. But I can't make that promise and I certainly can't deliver on anything, but perhaps in conversation between you and EEA, that's a possibility. I think that'd be lovely, but the bottom line is you need a building and it needs to happen soon. Thank you. Thank you. Another gentleman, you stand to us your name. <coughs> I want to stand up because I don't want to be. Uh, how about if I stand over here? Yeah. Everybody can see me here. Not that I'm handsome or anything. Um, my name is Twig Burlingame. I live in Florence. I actually graduated from the apprenticeship program as an adult in the electrical department in electrician. So, I'm actually part of Smith Folk, even though I never thought I was. I graduated from high school on that. Uh, maybe a background quick on me. Uh, I was in the Air Force for four years. I went to Vietnam. And whether you like him or don't, President Nixon uh, passed the Vietnam Adjustment Act, which meant that Vietnam veterans could have apprenticeship in any of the trades they wanted, or if there wasn't a trade. And I was lucky enough to be working on the ground screw at the VA at the time. And, uh, this opening came up, and Pete Doherty, who was a prominent electrician in the area, his son also, uh, worked up there. And he knew that I was interested in being an electrician. My grandfather was, and I learned something in the Air Force. But anyway, I got hired up there under this act, which was kind of like, uh, well, incorporated the, uh, the Veterans Act where you get out and get some money. So I was paid during four years of apprenticeship, working at the VA and then going to school there, which is, and it was a union class, so normally I wouldn't be able to get in on it, but Pete Doherty was a union got me in. So I went four years here at night to get my license, and then I got my journey, journeyman certificate, and I worked up the VA for almost 30 years, and then myself 10 years. So uh, I'm a tradesperson, so I'm interested in uh, school from a distance, but in the last three years or so, I have a granddaughter, Maggie Water, who's in animal science, and uh, she plays sports some of you um, and when she got stepped on by being her cow, it was like 800 pounds, stepped on her foot. I think at that point she decided she didn't want to be a large animal, so to speak. And I've heard of this uh, small animal program from 
companion animal. The police need a place to put animals. And it could be a good place for students to learn about small animals. And I didn't really know where it was going. I got online and read a couple of your minutes. And uh, I know you can't respond to me, but at some point maybe new business or something, you can say something. But I understand plumbing and electrical is going on there. And this is the old, you don't have to answer me, I assume it's the old rec department building. And uh, I could be wrong. And I'm not sure, it said the completion would be the spring of this year. My question would be if can be answered somehow uh, when that program would start. My granddaughter and I know a bunch of other kids like to get into that type of program, small animals, and there is a very uh, limited amount of veterinarians around this area. You wouldn't think so. Most every one of you, guarantee, had a dog or cat at some point, or a neighbor or whatever. I've been animals all my life, small. So, that's my interest to being here, and I don't usually like to go to meetings, speak in public, but I just thought I would. Thank you. I would like to ask for the approval for the board meetings, regular board of trustees meeting from December 19th. Motion. Second. So moved. Mario over there. I want to like, thank you for letting us take this opportunity. The presentation is up over there. Uh, so I know some of you are kind of backwards. I'll talk about quickly talk about the ninth and tenth grade stuff and what we've been doing. Rosemary will take over with the upper class. Um, one of the big things we've been trying to do is come um, work with the different grades um, with essential questions. You know, just you know, last year and this year has been a big push for this that connects what they're doing in the classroom to what they would might experience in the outside world. For example, with the freshmen, uh, they did digital book projects on books that they they worked in, in book clubs with the essential question, how do you set yourself up for success? Because students coming into high school need to know how to do that, especially because it's a different change um, from middle school. Uh, so what they were able to do is they picked these books that had young uh, protagonists around their age going through these different experiences and you know, trying to figure out what to do to succeed at whatever the issue was. The students did projects, uh, digital projects, that one was either developing a music playlist that chose songs that felt ideally connected to success. Um, we Are the Champions, for example, by Queen. Um, or they created Google searches and would explain what that character would search on using Google to help them succeed. Or they did a podcast. They created a podcast with classmates talking about, as the protagonist or the, um, as the students themselves, what went on in throughout the book to help that character succeed. Or if they didn't su succeed, what they could have done differently to succeed at whatever the um, conflict was. So that was just three different examples of what they did for digital projects. And again, the essential questions um, kind of adapt each trimester and ideally all connect by the end of the year. And this is something that all the different classes um, went through. Uh, the next slide does have other examples of these things. Um, again, um, the big three were the Google searches, uh, the music playlist, and the podcast. With the 10th grade, which is the next slide coming up, um, the focus on was justice. And I realized I didn't put the essential question up there, but it was um, what makes a criminal was the first one. And again, they chose books that, you know, such as uh, Trevor Noah's um, Border Crime um, and the other Westmore, which was another one that dealt with 
What Makes a Person a Criminal. Um, that was a very popular one. And same with the Trevor Noah one. And so they also did the book, um, the book club and the book projects, but they also looked into the like letters. They took an opportunity to look up laws that they didn't agree with. And they wrote these letters, you know, not with the intention of mailing them, though like, some did, some mailed them, um, looking at laws that they had issues with, that they didn't disagree, that they disagreed with and felt needed to be changed. And there were some hilarious ones. Uh, the, the snake breeder one was a good one, um, about like not being able to breed articulated pythons. Uh, another one, was, which was, I didn't know about the hunting, was a really popular one, a number of students Hunting's very popular, um, that they had a lot of issues with this, and it, having read the law myself, it did come off as very unfair. Uh, so that was a popular um, assignment that really engaged the students, and that was the big goal, was engaging students into these um, assignments that matter, that matter in the real world, too. Uh, and then one of the other things that we've been doing is trying to set them up for better MCAS success. Um, the the no writing and the quill are grammar and spelling uh, programs that we found online. No writing is really successful with the freshmen because it's an engaging way where it uses their own interests to come up with grammar assignments and uh, spelling assignments. By they go through this whole process for about 10 minutes when they sign up, choosing the things they're interested in, whether it's cartoons, automobiles, sports. So all the questions are geared toward those things that they know, and so they're connected with and they're more focused while they're working on it. Um, and then Quill has been used with a lot of the sophomore classes. And those are you know, more um, NCAS structured type questions. So they've been engaged with the no red ink. By the time they're in their sophomore class uh, year, they're seeing these same questions, but set up more how they might see a question on NCAS. Um, in the middle is Common Lit, and this is what a lot of the grades are now, all the grades are using. Um, and this is a program that's using the MCAS framework and it has these full 360 programs where everything's put together using essential questions. If, you, if we'd be able to zoom in, you'd see it has all these essential questions with the framework standard set up. And a lot of the questions, again, are set up how they might see it on MCAS and it tracks all the data for every assignment as they progress. And on top of that, it gives you other supplemental lessons and videos and um, movie clips that connect with whatever um, you might be reading and learning at the time. So they have these other things. If they're having a little trouble understanding, oh, here's it. It's already set up to have a YouTube little tutorial for them or a little movie clip to help better explain it. Um, I can go much deeper into this, but I don't want to do that right now. Um, it's been super successful across the board. Um, I think we're going to with the different classes. And that's for the 9th and 10th, and I'll let you take over. Okay, I will explain what was, what's going on for the 11th graders and the 12th graders. Um, currently, <coughs> we are working on a resume writing and cover letter unit for our juniors. So the emphasis uh, being to prepare the students for mock um, interviews, which takes place in shop. And I think the next go around, we had a postpone because of weather, but I think it's February 13th. Yeah with uh, But anyway, so what we've been doing with the juniors, um, it's a school-wide effort. First, the shops introduce uh, resumes and templates to their students according to what's in the field. Every field is slightly different. They might have a slightly different uh, way of doing their resume. Um, in English, we take them through skill sets that are not their competencies. So basically, we explain what soft skills are and how those are important just like the hard skills that are in the shop. Uh, from there, uh, some shops do the cover letters with students. Um, most, it's not a requirement, which is where the English department comes in. We ask students to look at sample cover letters. We ask them to pretend to uh, write a cover letter for a mock job that they might go on. We use Indeed.com to find that information. Uh, we ask the students to think about their cover letter as a per piece of persuasion persuading somebody to hire them, because that's what the whole junior year is about, persuasion. So also, we have Ms. Scantz, who's normally sitting back there as our librarian media specialist. 
she walks the students through thank you notes after the kids interview. So it's really a school-wide effort, spearheaded at the top by guidance, and then academics, and then the shop teachers, and then the librarian takes us through the whole process. The next step that we do after that, this is gearing students up to write an editorial or an opinion piece. So after the cover letters and the resumes, the students apply their knowledge of rhetoric to an editorial writing assignment. So students are encouraged to actually submit their editorials. We've had kids submit to the New York Times, which is where we actually got the idea from. Uh, we've had kids submit to Reuters, AP. Uh, we've had kids submit to Teen Age, which is actually smaller publication and it's student driven. So there's multiple opportunities for kids to submit their writing, which is what we want. We want them to write for you know real world audience. Okay, um, moving on to the seniors. This is something that uh, we've been doing for several years now since I've been here. Um, 12th grade storytelling through memoir writing. And we're very proud to have veterans come to visit us as we need the things they carry like Tim O'Brien. And I think that's, yeah, that's Doug Anderson. He's a local poet, and he's going to be coming in soon to uh, talk with the seniors and small groups. Uh, veterans Education Body to attack them. And so that's some pictures of book club projects that um, Lewis and Cody has talked about. So the boom balls and mosaics. The boom balls. Basically, a boom ball is simply the kids get pieces of paper and then they have to write down the themes of the book, the characters, <coughs> and make connections. And this is the essential quote is what it takes to be happy? What is, yeah, what is happiness? What is how happiness? Do we happiness? How do we achieve happiness? So every, every grade has an essential question. And that's a gamifying curriculum where the kids, uh, when they do book clubs, it's not just talking about the book. Okay? It's actually playing games, and it's actually building and creating and having discussion about what they read. So a gender game, um, we just did this one, that's a popular one. So the gender game might be, um, tell us a time about a character in the book who defied expectations. Okay, if you can do that, then you pick your gender block and just hope you don't fall in the class. Okay, so we, we gamify a bit to get them talking. Something to add that, this is fairly new for us, the AP program, We've done this since 2019 for the seniors, and there's a track record there of one, two, three, five years. And you can see that the numbers of kids who get college credit are increasing. So we started in 2019 with the LIT program, and it's growing. And eventually in 2020, um, well, there was no class offered there, but in 2021, that was the first year that we offered it. And so, the AP language exam for the 11th graders is based on rhetoric, not literature. So it's all language based. And our kids scored 2021, we had one student pass three in 2022 and four in 2023. So that's saying that all those students got college credit. They have passed a college class. And most of our students, even if they're not passing the exam, they're getting, say, a two, which means you're college ready. Okay, most of our students are two or above. We've had several ones, but most are two or above. And we thought it was a good idea to kind of stop and look at what our students are saying rather than what Mr. Cody and I could say about what our students are saying. So we do surveys with all of our students at the end of each evening to get feedback. And they, most of the feedbacks, they're not even putting your name on it, so they can be more honest. And we are seeing really good feedback yeah. this year because we put so much effort into more engaging lessons last year and this year, and we're seeing the progress in more student engagement, which is something that a lot of schools haven't been seeing over the past few years. Right. So, you know, again, like the the surveys are actually speaking for themselves. So right. we're, we're getting more feedback and honest feedback from students that they're liking what they're doing. I think we're also making more of a conscientious effort to solicit that feedback. Yeah. On Fridays we do this. Um, it's a work in progress. Nothing we do is stagnant. We're always constantly evaluating, looking at data, looking at what students are saying, keeping our fingers on the pulse. We don't want these to be stagnant. So we're, we're really trying to build up the program. Um, in the 14 years I've been here, I can say that there's only been improvements. We may have dips here and there, but general improvements. 
So I think that's about all we have to Thank you for letting us yeah. present that. Yeah, thank our, you. Uh, I just, Mr. Cody, yeah. I just want to acknowledge um, and thank Mr. Cody. Um, um, Mr. Cody has some circumstances, life that's taking him away from us, uh, and he'll be leaving at the end of the week. I just want to publicly thank you on behalf of the students. Uh, you've been a tremendous member of this community and, uh, and member of the English department. Uh, we wish you the best of luck, and thank you for everything that you've done on behalf of the students here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so I'll just share, like, I worked at Worcester Technical High School before this for 13 years, a school of almost 1,700 students. Um, the year and a half I've been here has felt like home. Um, I had a great department that I felt very engaged with, and that was something that was missing at the last mile, because it's such a big school, you get lost. This was constantly felt like it was a family that worked here. And that's that's from administration, guidance, the departments, like everyone my first year here, everyone made an effort to come and say hi to me, talk to me, like it's something I'm, I'm gonna miss and it's I leave with that part, so I wanted to know that. And I appreciated everything the department's done for me, um, and constant check-ins from New Year, that was great, and getting to know Josh this past year, like so. I appreciate it with every moment I've had. And I will till we find it. So thank you, I appreciate it. Good. Again, this shoes uh, Phil. I will try. Good job, guys. So jumping into uh, you know the again the first standard instructional leadership, just a couple brief updates from the past month. back in December before the December break. We hosted the MDAR, which is the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources, uh, the new commissioner, uh, Randall. She came on campus, and uh, it was a great opportunity to, to not only show her the main campus, but we got into the, our new van and drove up to the state lands and just showed her the, the expanse of resources that we have, and, and obviously the amount of resources that we have, and this is various uh, issues that we have to deal with and manage. Uh, it was a great opportunity. The photo that you see at the top, uh, she had it. She ended a tour with a, a brief meeting with the FFA chapter. Uh, she spoke a couple things about uh, Commissioner Randall. Um, there are some ties to SNF. She's local from Western Mass. Uh, I believe it was her grandfather who taught here. Her father went here. And her mother is on the side. So uh, a lot of connections. So it was great to, to, to have her here. The second one, this is one of my annual fun days, uh, participating with the criminal justice program uh, with her MRE challenge. Uh, so as a veteran, I've had my fair share of MREs, and uh, I've never had an MRE taste as good as what the criminal justice students uh, prepare. So uh, sort of their challenge is they're broken into various teams. Uh, they have to choose, I believe, three different MREs, and then come up with a, like I think it's a five-course meal based on those ingredients for the three MREs. And it's, they do a great job. So there's a lot of team building, a lot of good <coughs> thinking, uh, presentation skills, uh, and we sort of then debrief about those skills that they weren't really thinking about as they're preparing an MRE. How do those convey to life out of criminal justice when we live here? A law enforcement officer or an attorney or whatnot. Uh, so it is fun. Uh, and then I'm full for the next day and a half. Uh, moving into management and operations, uh, speaking about the container animal building, and just a couple of quick updates. So the ex exterior doors have been finally installed. We are not fully enclosed, so all the windows still have to be installed. At least we have some doors now in the building. And um, the plumbing inspection occurred uh, a couple weeks ago, I believe, as well. So uh, we passed with flying colors. There's still some small items that have to be completed from the plumbing side, but the major inspection has been done and has been passed, so that's great. Uh, and we are still waiting on the, the HVAC system. Uh, it is somewhere between manufacturer and the folks. So at some point once that uh, arrives, we can then get the heat up and running, fully close it in and finish off the building. Again, the goal is to have it done by the end of the school year and then have the program up and running next year. So the couple photos you see, uh, the one on the left is just a, a general, you see a lot of the duct, duct work that has been installed. Uh, you can't really see in fine detail, but a lot of the wires have been pulled, outlets have been installed. 
and then the window on the right again is one of the exterior, uh, the picture on the right is one of the exterior doors that was installed. So again, I can't thank uh, Tim Smith for his leadership, the custodial staff over the summer doing most of the framing, and then our, our plumbing students and electrical students doing all of the work inside up to this point. So uh, progress is being made. Con uh, continuing on with management and operations, uh, I, I shared this back in the fall. I just wanted to give the board a brief update. Uh, these are the, the positions or um, chairs that we want to fill uh, within our program advisory teams. And, uh, and the, sort of the notion that we had as, a, as an administrative team is as department heads within a particular shop, uh, as you talk to your advisory members, we're sort of sheltered, okay? We don't really know what's happening across the other 14 programs. And some programs struggle to fill all of the needs of the membership. Uh, so our thought this year was to, to begin to share this information out across all the, the advisory members, uh, share it with you as a board, because uh, I may have a neighbor, or I may have a partner, or I may have a friend, or whatever, that might be able to fill one of these, these seats. So I, I just want to take a moment and, and quickly run down some of the openings. So again, as board members, if you have somebody that you want to reach out to and tap on, on the shoulder and say, hey, We'd love to have you get involved with Smith Vocational, you know, give back to the school, give some recommendations. So with the advanced manufacturing, uh, they're looking for a racial or linguistic minority uh, individual. In Ag Mech, they're looking for post-secondary, along with somebody that would represent uh, apprenticeship programs. In animal science, they need organized labor in post-secondary. In automotive, they need a person with disabilities in post-secondary. Cabinet making, person with disabilities, racial linguistic minorities, parent guardian and a student, carpentry, person with disabilities, post-secondary, parent guardian and student, cosmetology, non-traditional student, or well, non-traditional individual, electrical, person with disabilities and racial linguistic, graphics, person with disabilities, racial linguistic minority, non-traditional, parent guardian, and in health tech, racial and uh, linguistic minority. And one thing that we talked to the department heads about uh, is not that these particular shops that have multiple openings, uh, that you, you have to look for multiple openings. Uh, that one individual might be able to sort of check off multiple categories. So uh, something just to keep in the back of mind. So I just want to thank the board. And again, if you can identify uh, any help there, we would greatly appreciate it. Question? Yes. <coughs> Animal science organized labor. Um, there's unions for That's animal science. That could that, be a, well, that, when that I could think of organized labor, I think of unions. I was involved with construction trades. Correct. So, could you <coughs> further explain? I can only assume that there is organized labor since that's still the need. Some shops that don't have any organized labor, they put NA. Mm -hmm. So, the fact that it wasn't NA. All right, so somebody on your advisory already or the the uh, teachers brought this forward okay great question any other questions or comments about this? thank you thank you now moving on to our favorite topic the horticulture building just want to give some updates and uh, so some background since we've last met uh, we had several site testing individuals on campus just testing the soil and uh, specifically around the existing uh, slab. So where the fire occurred, there were concerns about uh, contaminants being oil, gas, and some of the different petroleum products. So we bored several holes through the slab, did some testing, it all came back fine. So that was a major step in the right direction. And I think if we were uh, going to gamble, I think we would have you know, bet on having some contaminants in that particular area of the campus. So we, that's very positive news. Uh, on the flip side, uh, I do want to thank our instructional staff. They do a great, great work down there. Uh, they've already uh, agreed to remove, remove or move uh, the trees that are going to be in the construction zone, uh, and that's going to save the school a lot of money uh, rather than going out to bid. Uh, we'll talk about the estimate in a moment. So as they began to move some of the early, the, some smaller trees. Uh, we found a graveyard of some old equipment that was buried by the school many generations ago. Uh, so I am hoping that as we continue to excavate the 
construction site that we will find some valuable items that will be buried and we can perhaps put that towards the cost of the building. But um, <coughs> thus far we have not found anything overly valuable. Uh, I just I share that with the board that as we continue to dig, we have no idea what we're gonna find. Okay, but so far the testing came back uh, I don't want to say positive, I don't want to say negative. It came back with no bindings, okay, which is good. The design document phase. So again, as a board, you voted back in November uh, to move forward uh, to the design document phase of the construction project. The second estimate came back late last week. Uh, I met with SMMA uh, last Friday, and we met today with the building committee to uh, get into some of those uh, some of the details now. Uh, how I see it from my, my standpoint, there's a couple options. On your agenda this evening, uh, there is a motion to uh, review DD and, and, and make a vote if we move forward or not. I just want to sort of talk big picture and I'll drill down in the next few slides to give you some, some data. Uh, one option is to vote. <coughs> really have two options. One is the traditional stick build option, which is the traditional wood building. The other option is to revert back to discussions that we had back in November and December around a metal pre board. Okay, those are really the two paths as a board we have in front of you to vote on how we proceed. Okay, so we want the wooden building, we want the metal pre building, and perhaps it's not a matter of being wise and not a you as a decision maker on what path you want to have. So one option is this evening with that motion you can vote which one you want. Okay, and I'll, I'll share the dollar figures that are attached to, to either path. Option two is to delay that vote until your February 13th. Uh, so it's about three weeks. Uh, and we discussed this last week with SMMA. Uh, delaying the project by three weeks, does it throw the entire project off? No. Uh, does it continue to compress a, an already tight schedule? Yes. Uh, but SMMA is fully aware of that, and when I show the schedule, they've already revamped the schedule, assuming that may be the outcome this evening. Um, but again, if, you know, if, if they heard that the board voted on moving forward on whatever path, I'm, I'm sure they would be delighted. Um, so I just want to give that background. Part of the option two discussion that we had last Friday with SMMA is that I'm going to share the estimate numbers, I'm going to share some numbers around a potential prefab metal building. Uh, we discuss this as a board, that perhaps the board wants to authorize us to hire a local general contractor uh, to review the estimate numbers uh, to see if they're sort of in the ballpark for this region. Uh, and that would be just another data point as a board you have for the February 13th meeting. You have the, the estimate came, that came from SMMA, that I'll show you in a moment. You'll have an idea around the middle prefab building. You then have a data point from a local contractor to say, this is what we think it would cost to build this building. And you'd have that, that information to then vote on at the February 13th. Uh, again, there's pros and cons with either option. Uh, once that vote occurs, whether the vote occurs this evening or it really has to be by February 13th, and I'll, I'll elaborate on if we delay beyond February 13th, what happens. Uh, but once that vote occurs, whatever path you, you choose at the Board of, the board of Trustees, you move into the CD phase, which is the construction document phase. Uh, just as a reminder, during that phase, there will be yet another estimate that comes out uh, just to give you as a board an idea of where do we stand with potential uh, costs. So there is still that in the, in the schedule and in the budget. Once the CD uh, phase is complete, it comes back in front of you as a board to vote. And if we move forward, that's when we begin the official bidding process, and then we begin construction. <coughs> Before we start looking at the potential cost, I guess uh, I, I think I'd be failing my job if I failed to, to highlight again where we stand with revenue. Uh, since the, the December meeting, <coughs> as you know, we've had some very good uh, media coverage. We've had some good articles. You know, the, the video has been out. Uh, there's been several conversations. Thus far, nothing substantial has come in as far as potential uh, fundraising donations. Okay, really nothing substantial. So with that said, we are just north of six million dollars that we have for available funds at this point. And again, as provided, that's our skills capital grants that have to be spent by next June. Uh, that is the uh, economic bond bill that Senator Cumberford got through. That is the Smith College donation, uh, along with other smaller donations with individuals, uh, along with the insurance uh, payout. Uh, 
things to keep in mind. We most likely have to upgrade the electrical infrastructure. Uh, that was not in the initial plan, okay, but what we have currently for power going down back, most likely is not enough to now power this new building, in addition to the container uh, So there's going to be an additional cost there that we have to absorb somehow. Whether we absorb that through the $6 million, or we absorb that through tuition revolving or whatnot, the bottom line is it has to be absorbed. Uh, so that's a cost that we have to figure out. In addition to that, uh, the generator infrastructure that we have on campus most likely is not sufficient to also uh, power, in the case of an emergency, the new horticulture building. So most likely we're going to have to have some level of generator power for this new building, which again is an expense on top of building a building. Uh, I understand that this is a, a difficult decision. Uh, I've been saying this now for multiple years now, unfortunately. Uh, you know, the time has come just about to, to make a decision. Our students need a building, uh, and we have money available right now, just not enough, uh, but the money that we have is going to run out before we know it. So I do highly, highly, highly recommend as a board uh, you either vote this evening or, based on what I shared, you know, give us three weeks to see what some of the numbers. Dr. Pear uh, you know, shared the news from the state that perhaps there's going to be some support from the state, no guarantee. Uh, I personally went on the record during the building committee, uh, and I said I personally prefer the metal building. Uh, that was from my vantage point. I can only speak for me as a superintendent. Uh, and from my vantage point, unfortunately, is looking at the overall budget. It's looking at we need a building. Uh, that is, is hopefully uh, designed and built in a way to educate our students. I also am the superintendent of a campus that has a building that was built in the 1950s that has to be rebuilt at some point. And how do we deal with that? I'm also the superintendent of a campus that, with this model, we have an existing horticulture building that wasn't burnt down, okay? The remaining part, uh, we talked about this earlier today, uh, that needs some work if we're going to maintain that for the, the foreseeable future. Again, long term, we want to knock that down, we want to expand, we've talked about that you know, with this building project. We can expand to include a new greenhouse and headhouse, uh, but we cut all of that out because we're going to maintain the, the, the existing structure. There's probably going to be some costs that have to go into the existing structure so we can maintain it for the seven years. Where is that money coming from? Uh, so I, I share my, my opinion at the building committee. Uh, I, I do stand behind the middle building. Uh, I do think uh, the potential help from the state obviously would, would help a lot. There may be a hybrid option. Uh, you know, we do a metal building skeleton, a frame, and then we, we do some, some wood. Uh, there might be ways, but uh, I just, I, I've said this over and over and over again. Uh, we need a building. Uh, and I just, budget wise, unless the state comes through, but budget wise, I don't see how we're going to afford what you're going to see in the next one. Slide, so uh, just put that out there. Do you have an estimate for the upgraded electrical and the generator? <laughs> so the electrical, I want to say, it was several hundred thousand dollars. Uh, the generator. You're looking at over 100,000, 108 to 145, depending on the level of generator. So that would be an additional generator for the new building? Or? Correct. So, it's in the package? Okay. So what's on the screen uh, should be in your packet. This is a similar uh, from the November board meeting. That first column, that prefab metal building from the November 4th meeting, those are the numbers I shared with all of you back then. Uh, again, that was an early estimate on uh, what the actual construction cost of the new metal building, along with all the site work and so on and so forth. And you saw the total of 6.7 million uh, at the bottom. That includes soft costs, which is costs above and beyond construction costs. 6.8. Uh, that same day, we had a building committee meeting 
in the building committee did a straw poll they recommended that we try to move forward with the, the wood frame uh, so the report I gave to you that evening was we were under the assumption we were going to move forward with the metal tree back building the building committee made valid arguments valid points and without this pursue uh, the, the wood frame uh, so that's why we moved forward with DD with that you know that kind of that assumption uh, which is why when the estimate came back which I'll show you which is the middle column that's the estimate that came back last week that is assuming a late wood frame so that first row you can see just the, the difference between the, the construction system whether it's light wood frame or metal uh, and then you can see some of the other updates the big change and I want to thank Berkshire Design uh, they were the ones dealing with the site work design uh, as you saw back in November we were looking at uh, site work being just shy of a million dollars that has now come down to 599,000 as a big big savings so I want to thank them for their due diligence trying to find ways to to reduce those costs. Um, some other changes from November to, to last week. Uh, you'll see the design contingency. Back in November, we were looking at 406,000. That's down to the 238. And again, the, the, the idea behind that is, uh, as we get closer to construction, as we also have a design that was more detailed, uh, the estimator was able, able to give us a more accurate figure, uh, which means, hopefully, there should be less contingency should have a clearer picture of what this final cost is going to be, which is why that figure goes down. Unfortunately, the flip side is typically the construction cost goes up because back during the early phases, there wasn't an overly designed uh, to find detailed building. It was more of a basic square footage estimate. Uh, so uh, that four million for the light wood frame is a higher number now than it was collision cost came down. So it's sort of this seesaw, okay, put that out there. You do see escalation has gone up from November to now. That went from 97,000 to 112,000, uh, which concerns me a little bit. Why is escalation going up a little bit as we get closer to construction? And then you have uh, the markups. You know, we've talked about general conditions and general requirements and everything else. Uh, back in November, the estimator was sort of marking all of that up to about, about 20%. Uh, last week, when all of that, all those figures came in, it was about 15 and a half percent markup. So that's coming down slightly. You then add in your soft costs, and the estimate that we received last week, when you include the soft costs, is about 7.2 million. Which again, that concerned me when I saw this last Thursday and Friday. And I know the revenue is about six million, and that we're still looking at a 7.2 million dollar price tag. So I felt I would not do my job if I didn't raise to SMA what's the idea about going back to a metal prefab building. So I raised that last week. Uh, in that final column, I took some liberties. And I'll, I'll be fully transparent. Now I came up with that last column, I went back to the November metal prefab building cost, okay, and I just brought that three million over. Okay. Is that still accurate now? I can't speak on that. Okay. SMA was going to go and try to get an updated figure. But then everything else, all the other estimate numbers that came back last week, I carried over. So the site work, I carried over, and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, at the bottom, you can see potentially all in total for a metal prefab building with more current estimate numbers is 5.9. Uh, so that's where we're at. Uh, are we moving in the right direction? Yes. Uh, but we can't keep waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. So I do appeal to the board that at some point we have to make a decision that is not an easy decision to make, but we need to move forward at some point, whether it's tonight or at the February meeting. Uh, I just want to, before I open it to the board, I think the last slide I just want to share on this topic is the schedule. You should also have it in front of you, I believe. So SMMA has updated the schedule uh, to reflect the assumption that there is a three-week pause, that there would not be a vote this evening. Uh, if that vote occurs at the February 13th meeting, what happens? Um, so basically that means uh, we're on row 26, and they actually put in the pause, uh, and then at the 13th of February meeting, there would be approval of DD, whether it's the light wood structure or the metal prefab structure. And then sort of the ball continues to roll. Uh, 
uh, we start getting into the permitting has already begun. They're able to really get neck deep in permitting. And then uh, start getting into the prequal process of general contractor and bidding. That uh, will be happening uh, about now. We go out to bid in April and we want to break ground in May. Uh, again, finish the building by next summer. So again, a three-week pause doesn't necessarily derail the project. I want to be transparent about that. Uh, but what will derail the project is if we keep waiting. I can't say that. So with that said, before I move on with the rest of my report, I just want to open up any comments and questions. Um, we've come a long way. We started out with a gorgeous timber frame <coughs> building, state-of-the-art type of thing, using you know wood, renewable, um, or that es that budget estimate in the early design phase was twelve million dollars, and that was a reality check. We had this vision of this gorgeous timber frame building, and uh, that's just unfortunately not in the cards. So as Dr. Lincoln her, uh, identified, here we are today. Um, I. Uh, I would, this is me, um, I would vote for option two and hire a local GC to provide estimate on building material options as well as a new, a new estimate with the guys in the trenches that potentially will build the building. I think we'll get our best estimate then. Uh, unfortunately, we've got, what, three weeks to pull this off? So that is going to be a little bit of a task. So we'd have to move quickly on that. Um, Our guess is that that new estimate will cost us approximately eight to ten thousand dollars. Yeah. Oh, I, I think it's definitely worth it. That's my opinion. Um, and I am impressed. For Time, but I'll stay as long as possible. Another commitment. Um, so that's my vote, my opinion. I don't know if I, if we're going to vote now. I guess we should, right? On, on this task. We're still in discussion. Okay. Um, Mr. Parrot, do you have anything to add to this discussion? I think that getting a local assessment makes sense because it'll truth those uh, prices and they may mean that you can tighten your focus on, on uh, uh, eventualities. So there's a fairly high sort of carrying cost of, well, the price could go up, you've got a lot of cushion built in, but to truth the pricing will reduce that. I think that's virtuous and can narrow in appropriately. You're going to get there. I think it's an $8,000 that's what's worth the first one. I agree. So, I don't mean to go back to this, but um, it, you didn't build in the electrical. So, what I heard is we need to add $300,000 to any of this, <coughs> roughly. Four, yeah, several hundred plus right. 150. Mm -hmm. So, I, that needs to be factored. Plus, plus, another discussion we've had is radium for heating. So everybody in the committee sees the value of radio equipment, especially on, on the shop side, okay, the shop areas. The estimate that we have does include, because it's difficult to tear up concrete okay, after the fact, so the estimate does include the plumbing that would be laid into right. the property. Uh, so that would at least be there. Uh, it does not include the actual system that would then pump the fluid through the piping to create the radium floor heat. That system, uh, the estimate came back at 235000 so if we wanted to have reading and heat from the get-go, it's another two hundred and thirty-five thousand on top of the I I don't know if I'm it's the appropriate time to speak. I don't know if I'm sorry. Sorry. Okay, forgive me. Um, so one of the suggestions that was talked about was a pellet heating system. So the additional heat that you're describing is on top of the airspace <coughs> heat that's already afforded. So it's sort of a duplicated heating system. So air conditioning, we have to decide, is it a necessary uh, conditioning for the classrooms, 
the offices and the bathrooms. Probably not going to be afforded for the shop space. It's just giant doors. You have a, a seasonal load and it's mostly a heat load. So one of the things that the Forest Service has already offered is that they would be willing to pick up half the price of a wood heating system. A wood heating system would eliminate the need for electrical adjustments, a generator, and the existing heat as described. So Sanderson Academy, Charlemont, both did 30,000 square foot buildings for 300 grand. This is a 10,000 square foot building. So maybe we could imagine 150. So all in, we're probably 75 to 100. That's a lot less than having to upgrade the electrical, have a generator, and a <coughs> heating system so that you can have radiant floors. It's a choice, but it is definitely the most affordable, 100% renewable choice. But again, it's a choice. Comes? Questions? Anybody else? So moving on, family and community engagement. Uh, I won't click on it, just I think out of respect for time, but the oh, Gina Renews letter. Hold on, um, before you move on, um, Andy, um, can we vote on this now? Hold on, Andy. Can I vote in abstention? Can I file my vote now? It's not, not appropriate. Sure. Is there a way to change the order of the agenda? I'd appreciate it. Yeah. I think it's prudent. Thank you for offering that suggestion. So if you look at item six on the agenda, both to approve design documentation for the horticulture building project, we have to bring forward uh, a motion and a second. A motion? A motion to bring it forward? Yeah, it's on the, it's on the agenda, but we need, if we're going to vote on it. Okay. We need to, I, Make a motion to bring forward the vote on option one, two for the horticulture building. Second. Discussion? So your motion is for which option? Is for the second out of these three? Isn't it? It's just it's to, to move the vote forward. forward. For now. We're changing the order of the agenda. We haven't gotten to the vote yet. No. So we're going to bring it forward. So now we have to have them to start reporting in regards to the way the agenda is going to be done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
two different votes, a vote to delay, and then the second would be a vote to hire a local general. Okay, so keeping that in mind. So there's two votes that way. So I motion to move this forward. Well, we have a suggestion to table it. Yeah, that's it. Well, why can't you? <laughs> it's my thing. Okay, um, what Julie said. Um, I moved to table the design document decision to February 13th. Right on. And that's then all. we that's also. Just say, just stop there. Yeah. I second. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 I move to, to also vote. I, I move that to hire a local QC to provide an estimate. Yes. Of yes, I got it. Thank you. Um, I move to vote to hire a local GC to provide estimate on building material options. Second. <laughs> What, uh, so what was the cost of this again? We are thinking between eight and ten thousand. I think it will come in less, but that's accurate. I would say. And that would come out of the our bottom line. We have a discussion. Community engagement. Uh, I will click on the January move letter just so the board can see. Uh, again, same format. This went out uh, actually not on January 1st. It was a holiday, but I think that, that Friday that we got back, this went out to the community. And I just wanted to, to highlight again my focus this month was around co op, sort of the purpose behind co op, the regulations around co op, the, the, the relationship not only between the students and the shops and the school, but also the employers and how it's sort of this, uh, this relationship that goes in both directions. Uh, and then as in past months, Mr. Bianca had um, his article, you know, we had various updates. Uh, ski Club, I see Chef in the, in the audience, and we're just highlighting our, our recent trip to the Ski Club, the FFA, what they've been doing, some fundraising, and, uh, and again, current events. And, that went out beginning of this month. In addition to that, I just want to take a few moments and highlight there's been several meetings and discussions that have, that have been happening at the school level and the state level. Uh, I think the board is fully aware that there's a hot topic across the state around admissions with vocational schools and specifically lottery. We're talking about this. Uh, I had a meeting, I, I talked about it at the board, with the board, Senator Cumberford last month. On January 5th, I had a similar meeting with Senator Velas's office. Uh, so he is based out of Westfield, but he oversees many communities that also feed into some vocational. Uh, had a great conversation, again, talking about the pros and cons around the admissions concerns and around the lottery. Uh, just making sure that his office is fully aware and hopefully we'll have uh, a big picture when it comes to any potential discussions at the State House. So that occurred. Uh, we've had a couple school based health center update meetings. I just had one earlier today, actually. Again, we are in the process, we being the, the Hilltown Health Network, uh, they're in the process of finalizing a hire uh, for behavioral health. Uh, they're in the earlier stage of trying to hire a community health worker. Uh, after today's meeting, uh, the goal is, it sounds like, uh, there's gonna be a, a subcommittee meeting later this week to identify students that we, uh, we think we should be able to uh, consult with the behavioral health therapist. Uh, that will then spearhead a whole bunch of paperwork and referrals and insurance and so on and so forth. Our hope is to have the first counseling sessions uh, at the earliest, the Wednesday we come back from February 1st. Uh, right now, it sounds like the therapist will be working with our students on Wednesdays, uh, so we're sort of targeted that Wednesday after February break as the first day. If not, it would be early March. So that ball is definitely rolling in the right 
direction. We've had a few meetings with uh, excuse me, sir. Um, I need to excuse myself. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for moving that forward. Thank you, John, for having your thoughts. <laughs> had a few meetings with Cooley Dickinson, uh, which have now moved on to meeting with Mass General Brigham out of Boston. Uh, so if you're aware or not, uh, the school has an athletic trainer. Uh, North Hampton High actually has an athletic trainer. Uh, both are funded by Cooley Dickinson. Uh, and, I, and I learned the history behind that. I won't get into the history uh, here today, but there was uh, discussions between the hospital and the city many years ago, many mayors ago. Uh, and sort of this agreement was uh, that the hospital would fund this athletic trainer model for North Hampton High. Uh, so that was the original agreement. Smith Vocational came along, we're expanding our athletic programs, and uh, the hospital offered us the same service. Uh, so we've had an athletic trainer over the last several years in the hospital. As we know, Cooley Dickinson is part of Mass General, and uh, they are trying to create a much larger athletic trainer service model, uh, because there's obviously many hospitals across the region. And uh, the model has the potential a lot of benefits for us in that our particular athletic trainer would be part of Mass General now, uh, would have access to more professional development, would have access to more networking with other athletic trainers across the region, and God forbid, you know, we're down the trainer or we need a second trainer, uh, we might have a list of available athletic trainers in the future that we can tap into to bring our particular athletic trainers uh, unavailable for any reason. So uh, there are a lot of positives. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, what we're looking at is creating a, a model where we're hiring an athletic trainer through Mass General. Okay? But Cooley Dickinson continues probably a grant program where the funding for that particular athletic trainer still comes from Cooley Dickinson. So there'll still be no cost for Smith Vocational, and I would assume we're going to hire the new trainer as well. But, uh, so, some good conversations. I think a lot of great positive potential for our particular athletic, uh, athletic trainer. Moving on, uh, I, I just felt the board needs to be aware of this. Uh, so after that, that first meeting uh, that Dr. Spencer Robinson and I had with Senator Comerford talking about lottery and admissions, that sort of led to bigger picture uh, discussions. So Senator Comerford is coming to visit this Friday uh, to talk about just our vision as a school, looking at debuilding, you know, how do we deal with construction and so on and so forth. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that meeting on Friday. Through all of that, uh, Senator Comerford's office was talking to uh, MSBA. Uh, the MSBA executive director plans on visiting Western Mass and wants to visit some Western Mass schools. Uh, Senator Comerford thought, based on who we are and our needs and sort of our history and our complexities around the governance and around trying to build a new building, it might be wise to have MSBA come and visit and talk to us. Uh, I love the idea. We agreed that we'd have a visit on February 6th. I was prepared this evening to tell you we're going to have MSBA on campus February 6th. Uh, but then something happened. Uh, MSBA backed up. And uh, I, I just put in quotation marks a part of the response I got from Senator Comerford's office. And I just want the board to be aware. Uh, this is part of their rationale. Uh, so it's in part to a complicated history here in Smith Grove not having submitted a statement of interest. So I can comment on the not submitting a statement of interest. We're not in a position yet to submit a statement of interest to talk about a new deal building until we figure out how we're going to deal with everything. Uh, so I'll stand by that. If they don't want to visit because we don't have a statement of interest, I, I, I value that. Okay? They're a busy entity. Uh, it politically may not look good if they come and visit us if we don't have a current statement of interest in the pipeline. I get that. Uh, but in part to a complicated history here really struck me why would a non-political state agency decide to not come here because of spilt milk? Uh, spilt milk is my words. Um, I just, I was offended by that, honestly. Uh, and I shared that with MAVA. Uh, MAVA colleagues have a similar history in that uh, when schools get into the pipeline with MSBA, some of the initial feedback are from their state senators and representatives. They have a chance to step up and talk about, as a senator or as a representative, uh, they advocate for the schools, and it becomes very political, uh, which is unfortunate for a, should be a non-political agency. Uh, so, 
I worry that if we have a poor pass with the MSBA, how is that going to impact us moving forward if and when we get to the point where we can talk about uh, and we need So I share that. I'm going to share all of this with Senator Comerford on Friday, uh, but I wanted the board to be aware first. Um, Dr. Lincoln McGrath, I want to offer a slightly different perspective that um, may not be as informed as yours. So bringing my background um, and the experience with this um, to the for consideration. Um, I was the one who initiated the invitation to Dr. to Dr. to Senator um, to uh, see G building and um, to help her understand how complicated the challenge is to replace that structure, right? Politically because of so my my the this I, I think Senator Comerford is a woman of action. I know she is based on her you know on her legislative history, but um, and her office too just crackled that way. So how I interpreted that. So I, I was thinking the visit this Friday would be like, hey, this is the complicated history. The Donahue report. I'm, I'm sure she's familiar with it, but just make, you know revisit that and sort of all the nuances there. Um, and, and then see what the next steps would be. So I was thinking on Fridays being a very, very, very basic introductory kind of like, okay, let's just understand what's happening here. I think that um, her office, um, and certainly under her direction, really leapt to say, hey, you know, this, uh, the MSPA director is coming to us, let's get them to Smith vote and we'll create advocacy on her part for sure maybe not fully understanding how complex it is and that's what the point of Friday is. So does that, that and, and so I understand this bill will open the politics and other potentially other vocational schools not okay maybe not at all. Uh, but that's how I was looking at it. Like, oh just kind of cross wires a little bit like instead of going one, two, three, and then went to one, two, three, oh let's get back to two and I, I have full respect of Senator Cumberford and her efforts. Uh, I just felt MSBA should have declined the offer so we didn't, we didn't have a statement of interest in the pipeline. Say that, and I accept it. Right. And but I, the fact that you want to bring up history for one of the reasons why you want to visit. Do you have a sense of, as I, so I read the complicated history as meaning our governance model. Do you have a different Venture Associates, most of you know our lobbying firm that we work with for MAVA. Uh, we have a representative Gonzalez, he's out of Springfield. He's the House Chair uh, of the Committee on Public Safety and Homeland Security. And they had a very positive meeting uh, that included that the committee's legal counsel. It sounds to everybody that was involved in that meeting uh, that a bill will be coming out of committee uh, in support of what we've been pushing for within MAVA. Uh, and basically what that bill will be that part of the exception to hoisting will allow students to access equipment that you need a hoisting license for. Uh, it would allow that, that education to occur if the student is operating the equipment under direct supervision of a, one, a Chapter 74 instructor who also happens to have a valid hoisting license. Uh, so that's going to be the recommendation most likely to be that committee. <coughs> in, in that particular meeting, uh, Representative Gonzalez actually did reference the Smith Vocational and our students teachers that went down and advocated at the State House, so I can remember this, which is pretty so. I share that's some positive news, keep our fingers crossed that uh, before you know it, our students will be able to use all of the equipment. <coughs> Professional culture, uh, I, I just listed once, but again, I can't thank uh, Mr. Bianca uh, enough with his leadership around the NDAC and the steering committee and all of the work of the faculty by uh, getting ready for the division in March. Uh, so we're just about at the 12th hour, uh, getting all of the reports uh, finalized and voted upon by the staff. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Bianca can talk about it the chair. So we, we're getting there. We're getting uh, very close to March, and we'll be ready. I attended the CBSR luncheon back in uh, early part of January. Attorney Law came and 
presented on it. And again, just some legal updates across the state, which is always nice. Uh, I want to thank again Mr. Bianca for inviting various staff uh, to the faculty meeting to do a presentation. So this past month we had Megan Lena, uh, she's one of our biology teachers. Uh, she did a presentation on implementing storylines in biology. Uh, it's a new curriculum that she found, uh, and it's it was amazing to hear what she's doing in her classroom and, and the engagement, the level of engagement and the increase of the level of engagement for some of students, uh, which is great and motivating. So that was nice. And then uh, this past week I went down to Devon's, uh, my last official role as a model officer, and uh, presented to this year Leadership One candidates, which is great. It's sort of rewarding. Uh, what happens on this particular day is the first session for new Leadership One candidates. Uh, all the officers we get broken out to different tables, and there's talking points. And we, we talk to the Leadership One candidates, who are typically current teachers within a vocational school, uh, not only vocational instructors, but also academic teachers. And uh, we, we just talk about leadership uh, and different components of leadership. My particular topic that I was facilitating with my table was around you know, the, the relationship between staff and administration. What does that look like and how do you make a positive relationship between staff and administration? So a great day uh, that happened last month. Those are no donations to report this month. In the news, as I mentioned, we've got a lot of good PR. Uh, the article on the left uh, was an editorial uh, in response to uh, the admissions and lottery article that I was quoted in uh, a few weeks ago. Again, talking about from my vantage point with the lottery, uh, the lottery is essentially rearranging the seats, okay, and, and telling different people, yes, you're in, telling other people, no, you're not in. Uh, the answer to the issue is, I don't want to say no to anybody. A family is choosing to send his or her daughter to a vocational school for a reason. Who am I to say no? Uh, I want to say yes to any student and any family who wants access to, access to a vocational <laughs> school. We simply don't have enough seats. Uh, so again, the easy answer and the right answer is to expand capacity, offer more seats. I know that that is attached to money. Uh, so anyways, that was sort of the crux of the article on the Gazette, and there's an editorial basically supporting the article. Uh, as you probably, I'm not sure if you were able to witness, uh, the. The tractor parade, okay, but we were participating in that. Uh, and then the article on the right, again, was summarizing the, the visit that we had from uh, Commissioner Randall. Looking ahead, I just want to touch on a couple things. Uh, today was the kickoff to the FY24 budget meetings. Uh, my day was basically spent with Mr. Bianca in his office, uh, listening to the department heads beginning to advocate for the budgets for next year. So uh, it's a great start, and we'll be ready to present to the board. <coughs> Hopefully in March, we need to have something approved by April. Uh, I do want to jump down. I already talked about Senator Cumber from coming on Friday uh, to, to highlight the mayor of uh, the joint meeting uh, next week, just as a reminder for the board. Uh, I do want to highlight tomorrow morning we were supposed to have the general advisory committee uh, tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock in the library. Uh, I made the, the decision this morning, not knowing how the weather's going to be in the morning. We have postponed that meeting to next Wednesday, that's January 31st. Same time, 7 o'clock in the restaurant. So just trying to plan ahead. Beyond that, um, that's about it. I do plan on my February meeting uh, will be sort of that state of the school presentation. Just talking about big picture, how are we doing with the school and the enrollment, and uh, where are we? And I, I think it's a good segue to then get the budget in March. With that, I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Bailey. Our student reps couldn't be with us tonight. Uh, our enrollment currently sits at 573 total students. You can see the application year over year over the last five years. Uh, we are up, we're at 230 applications at this time. Uh, 24 up over January 2024. Uh, right now we have 50 from Northampton, so 21.7% of applications on file. As Dr. Lincoln Hoker said, we did begin our budget meetings this week and uh, we'll Ms. Fairman and I will work together to come up with a building level budget to present to him, uh, hopefully right after February break, maybe before, but um, definitely after February break, you can have that and sit and meet with him uh, to discuss our recommendations. School Council, we're in process of updating the student handbook. Uh, Mr. Sabonis, one of our assistant principals, is leading that effort. Uh, 
just to let you know the youth advisory meetings um, we planned an idea around positive choices month uh, we're using spiffy data um, I apologize because that didn't update uh, but our next meeting is tomorrow uh, we've formed three subcommittees with the students um, so we have a subcommittees that are all focused on the messaging that will happen in March. We have one that is the visual subcommittee working on posters and uh, other visuals like some things from the front side. Uh, they want to work in collaboration for our social media to put out uh, positive graphics and, and around choosing positive behaviors and identifying um, some of the data that we have out of Smithy. We have another one that will be doing announcements. That subcommittee is working on those. And uh, we're going to end up having a sort of a public service announcement PSA video contest. Uh, so the youth advisory is going to, the other committee is that video committee. Uh, and they're actually going to produce three short 30 second, 40 second clips that we can share out with the community on different topics, uh, asking different questions. Uh, and one of them is going to be the uh, senior sit down. So they're going to have seniors talk about uh, advice they would give themselves if, if they could go back to talk to their freshman self and things like that. So we're excited about it. I hope it, I hope it comes out well. And then we're going to give a, we'll have a, a competition out to the uh, various 15 shops around producing their own video and then picking the winner for pizza party. Um, on personnel, you'll see that uh, we have posted for a vocational, assisting vocational instructor uh, in health for long-term subposition. So we posted that job after in October. Um, we did have some candidates. Those candidates did not continue on in the process. We have not had any uh, candidates for the health technology instructor's position. So the vocational assistant that's in there is currently in the long-term sub role as the instructor. Um, and now we don't really see that happening on the near horizon, so we're going to post and fill her position so they have three people uh, in there. So that'll be there. We did repost the health assisting instructor and uh, we posted for an English long term sub to fill that gap with Mr. Cody leaving. Uh, we did hire, we hired uh, retired teacher Kathy Brown, who is English certified. She's going to come back and uh, provide us uh, and the students great uh, instruction through the end of the school year. So we're lucky to find somebody with the teaching license and has the ability to, to fill that role. We'll repost for that role. Uh, middle end of March when we do all of our normal postings, <coughs> trying to hit uh, all those up and coming graduates who are looking for employment. So, any other questions? That's my presentation for this evening. Um, Mr. Bianca, I miss having students at our meetings, and um, I have a question for you. Sure. The, mayor. Um, the question for you is what do you think are the challenges to getting students to come to the meetings and for the mayor? What's your experience with your public school committee? Do you have student representatives there? Do they attend regularly? How? I know we have folks, our students come from far and by, and that is potentially an issue. But just one point to do from the two of you about how we could get a potentially get a reliable, regular student presence at a meeting. Well, one of them's an athlete, so basketball season's right now, and that's who's here in the fall. Uh, but definitely the athletics are in the way for him. Uh, the, the other one is around uh, transportation. So I'll continue to work with him. Coming, getting your money, and then getting back home. Yeah. And what's your experience? The student advisory member attends every meeting, and then there's the student advisory council at the other meeting sessions. So right before the school.
thought there, so the misrepresentation using the technology. Meaning that it's not covered. True, but for that person's presence, yeah, it's not that it's a hybrid, it's just him zooming in. I think that, that if they were, if this was removed at the beginning and it was more predictable time of when they were going to report, you know. Yeah. So potentially if we started, but they do start the meeting with the student report so they know yeah. it's at five? I think, that would, I think that's a, a recommendation that we bring to the two students that we do that. Um, and see if that would make a difference to them. I think it could make a difference. Yeah. Do, you all, do you have video production? Pre-recording themselves yeah. and then we just play it. Yeah. It could be an option. Yeah. yeah. They wouldn't be present, but right. That's Which would be our first choice for sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sure. I'll, I'll ask. <coughs> the board's willing to do that. More proper. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to them. Thank you. So this is for Tim Smith. Not much to report on facilities. Uh, he continues to wait on the windows and the heat pump for the companion animal building. Plumbing, plumbing has completed their rough in and it has been inspected. Working with a roofing company to address some of the recent leaks. And the sewer line project for the farm area companion animal building has a contract with Hatfield Equipment and the project is to start as soon as one We're hoping to get it started sooner, unfortunately. The letter. Sure. So uh, my report, um, the, as of January 1st, 2024, the IRS uh, changed the travel reimbursement rate to 67 cents. Previously, the board had, uh, had voted that we just um, accept that rate. The um, Great news, the city appropriated funds to cover the increase of the stipends for the, um, the difference in the board of trustees. So that was actually put into the So that was a great news. The last meeting I reported about the unemployment, the seasonal um, designation for the um, sports. The city HR director, um, Chad Dunn, has filed an appeal with the Department of Unemployment. Um, as of the other day, we still have not. Students. Unfortunately, uh, last week was hectic between a holiday and a snow day and we had a lava. Just things happened, and I'll take ownership that we didn't get that agenda item on the agenda. Uh, so I, I, I've asked the chair, uh, based on the clause at the end of the agenda, you know, things we could bring forth. This is not technically a new out of right field agenda item. We did agree on it last month. I just forgot to get on the official agenda. So I do ask the, the chair to get asked agenda item to vote on the international trip to Italy. Uh, that is the tentative will be planned for February of 25. I would hope to have that approved and have a motion. Yeah, I'll bring forth the motion to approve the school trip. Thank you. 
This year they focused on vocational schools. A lot of vocational schools are single person departments. Um, so a lot of the focus was to be able to create almost a multi-district language department. Uh, in this case we, we voted, uh, uh, we approved um, our Spanish teacher Aaron Mendelson to go ahead and, and sign on to that grant. We never knew what money there would be potentially or, or what the outcome would be. Uh, but they did receive the grant, so there is money for professional development, there's money for to backfill for subs, uh, there's money for curriculum and, and instruction materials and writing, so um, it, particularly um, the amount is $900 per teacher, um, which we would get, we would put to them for reimbursement um, to pay for that. Uh, they would also pay for mileage, um, substitutes, and um, there's potential of curriculum writing um, up to $2,000 in the future. So this is going to increase the collaboration between the schools, but it's also going to give our Spanish teacher, uh, Mr. Mendelssohn, uh, access to a, a lot of people uh, and, and, and resources and back to the money. So I don't know if you want to talk about the money side of it. Or sure. So we're, um, Mr. Mendelssohn has been working on the teacher from the show, but it is actually taking the lead. Um, so we're waiting for just a breakdown on what will uh, what will be uh, will receive and what will receive. That sounds like a great opportunity to serve an important part of our student population um, and successfully addressing that kind of dearth of collaborators or just a single person in the yeah. entire school. Do you have any sense yet of what those proficiency based outcomes might um, look like? I not yet. It's a fantastic term. Yeah. Love yeah. That. Well, one of it is is that it is the push for the seal of biliteracy, which we push for here. Okay. Um, so they're looking at building things to be able to work towards that. So the students that are officially bilingual. Okay. Yep. So I know that's one. So I, what we're looking for is the approval for us to be able to spend and then get the reimbursed for that. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The next item, next page. <clears throat> Northam Education Foundation sponsored the teacher program, three thousand dollars for three D mapping. Okay. Second. This is for criminal justice. Uh, that we see as a partner, so that we actually do some three D mapping on campus, which is a skill set for law enforcement. Can I just add one thing that um, Sam Hunter, who is on the board of the North Indian Education Foundation, is coming to visit soon at the Foundation School on Friday. We're having lunch. She has some questions about um, some ideas about the need for prints, small bits from any of her lack of fear of prints. So we'd like to run your conversation invitation. So I'm excited about that. I'm happy to see these two grants and we'll be more. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Northern Education Foundation is 
programs, continuous programs, fifteen hundred dollars for Doug Anderson, the things he carries. So, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Career technical initiative grant, CTI, two hundred forty thousand dollars for culinary. Adult head. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Recommended March meeting. Changed to March 26 for <clears throat> Future business Tuesday, February 13th, Board of Trustees meeting at 5 o'clock here. Tuesday, March 26th, Board of Trustees meeting at 5 o'clock here. Tuesday, April 9th, Board of Trustees meeting at 5 o'clock here. <clears throat> Upcoming events March 4th through the 7th, DESE TF and review. That will be here on site. Yes. Can I, can I just throw out the meeting dates and the March and April meetings are just are pretty close together in that form of this? I would have asked if I could talk about it. So we're going to want to consider moving people meeting until after the vacation? So we don't mind if there's a meeting. Right. So I just wanted to confirm before I said something on the term. The February 13th meeting, uh, the recommendation of the 13th is actually a week earlier than normal. Yeah. Uh, Today's the third because it's February break. Right. Uh, so that's why we recommended the 13th. The March date and the April date, the challenge there um, is according to the bylaw, March 26th, we're recommending we bump back, hopefully, as is the more common, trying to wait for the tuition rate from the state. If we meet as we normally meet in March, I don't think I've been here and we've got a tuition rate for that particular meeting in March. So if I we delay a week, we may have the numbers, they have a more uh, realistic budget for you. Uh, the challenge if we push the April date back, right, and you recognize that, but the bylaws of the city, we need to have an approved budget, approved by the board, and through the mayor. Uh, I think if we wait another week, maybe beyond the deadline. Thank you, So, um, let's go read these dates. March 20th, 2024, spring program advisory committee dinner and meetings. That's for the FFA, so that's separate. State Convention, Chairman, President, Mayor. 